to uh, go on to our last speaker, Dr. Unikrishan Nair, who's the medical director and senior consultant of Chaitanya Group of Eye Hospitals and deals with a lot of uh, subspecialities, vitreo retina, uvia, neuroophthal, and electrodiagnostics. And he is going to be talking on OCTA, uh, differential analysis of vascular plexus and vascular pathology. And I would also like to thank him because we discussed these topics with him and he was very supportive. And uh, thank you, Dr. Uni, sir, for uh, your contributions as well. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, um, Srinivas told me to talk about something different, basically, that is understanding artifacts rather than the vascular plexus. There's a small change in the uh, topic also. So uh, I'll just uh, share things over here and share. And, uh, okay. So... Um, uh, this is a typical slide that we all use uh, to talk about OCTA, that is it's a repetitive scan and the difference between the two scans is what brings out the, uh, the imaging in OCTA. So I'd like to say that there are rules of imaging. There's an object to be imaged and an image to be acquired. And the rules of imaging tell you that uh, there are going to be problems happening and those are called artifacts. And you have to respect and know those artifacts if you have to interpret the image. So essentially understanding the technology means you have also have to understand the failure of technology. And when it comes to OCTA, you have to know how the flow is detected. What is the difference between the B scans? What are the problems? So you, know, you have to know what are the problems created during the capture, what the software does to help you and to, uh, to, uh, to uh, make life difficult for you, what you see, and eventually how to incorporate understanding these artifacts into what you interpret. So I, I've just, uh, this is a very basic presentation and we're going to look at the artifacts as four. The first is what we call bulk uh, motion artifact. So this is a very historic picture. It's called pendulum on a ship. Uh, the gentleman is Christian. He uh, decided was that if you put a pendulum on a ship and uh, it uh, swings properly, you could actually de determine latitude using it. Okay. So the problem in Okta is the same thing. A pendulum on a ship on a smooth sea is okay. It, it goes uh, regularly. But if the sea is also rough, your pendulum uh, varies in time. So this is uh, the pendulum on the ship, and it's the same thing. Uh, and why does this happen? For an octa, first the scan has to go through a raster. It has to fly back to the original position, and then it has to scan again. So you have a TS, which is T scanning, and a flyback time, or TF. And the inter-scan time, the total time between the scan is the time between the scanning time and the flyback time. So why is, uh, why is this important? Uh, if you shorten the inter-scan time, the time between two scans, uh, you may miss the time for the, uh, the motion to have happened. That, the, that is the RBC to have moved, you might have missed it. So the sensitivity comes down. If you in increase the inter-scan times, you will pick up movement better because the RBC would have passed on. You would, you would pick up and say, okay, a flow has happened. But the longer you push the inter-scan times, the more the eye or the more the imaging system is prone to movement. That is, movement will affect uh, the scanning protocol. So uh, shorter inter-scan times, it's, it's less sensitive. Longer your, uh, you open the eye to bulk eye movement. So uh, this is what we said. If you have a longer time, you have ability to uh, flow, but the system uh, gets saturated uh, very, uh, very, very early. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is a small summary of the saying is that you have, if you want to pick up the slowest possible flow, you have to have a longer uh, inter-scan time. But the problem is that uh, they get saturated. So the color of the scan, uh, if it's more white, it doesn't, it just simply does not mean that the flow is more. That's how an OCTA works. And as I said, when the movement of the eye, the head or the body, uh, because of la la longer scan time, it's called motion artifacts. And there are a couple of types of motions, that is the artifacts that are produced by motion directly, as you see, and or uh, the artifacts that are produced because the system or the software corrects for the motion. And you see breaks in the pictures like that. So basically, Motion artifacts, we're talking about three or two or three artifacts. Uh, one is the white line artifact. Uh, the second is the vessel doubling. You have a stretch artifact. These pictures show it. The white line artifact is one see is, is the one you see here. The, uh, the motion uh, is translated to a, a, a signal that is a white line. The second image you have at the edges because of long edges scanning, you have stretching of the image, stretching of uh, you can see on the right hand side. These are called stretch artifacts. This is called a kiloting artifact where you have 
uh, rectangular uh, a tile or osaic like pattern happening and the lower image is because of a doubling a vessel doubling artifact on all these are because of motion so uh, there are a couple of artifacts that happen without major movement that is you have uh, because of small changes like uh, lipid particles moving in a cystoid macular edema or reflections that happen off the wall of a cystoid macular edema gives a false impression of blood vessels so these are uh, two other types of motion artifacts and uh, the new terminology that has come is suspended particles in motion that is uh, lipid particles in cystoid spaces uh, interestingly, there are micro movements inside the eye, uh, like the pulsation of the choroidal lobules or uh, uh, artifacts produced by uh, the curvature of the eye. And these are called Z-axis motion artifacts, which produce white lines, whether or not uh, there. The second type of artifact would be attenuation. So every system has got a threshold. Why do you need a threshold in a system is that you have to eliminate all the unnecessary uh, noise or signals. And then only the signal becomes uh, good enough to interpret. So what is the problem of this is that when you are, uh, when you, uh, uh, when the threshold removes a signal and it recognizes as an absence of flow in an octa, you have to differentiate it from an actual attenuation uh, of the signal that's called uh, this, uh, the attenuation artifact. So if you have a local opacity and it uh, uh, blocks the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the information coming back to the transducers and, and, and it blocks it to the interferometer, then uh, there in which you have a blocker. So here you can see there is a dark line artifact. Uh, and if you also have a recognition of what the what causes it, you will know that these artifacts, the black artifacts are because of an attenuation of the signal. And therefore you get false positive and false negative. There's false positive. You get, uh, as we said, uh, various uh, decorrelation signals produces a white artifact where there is no flow and the false negative is what we're talking about, the attenuation artifact. We'll go to segmentation errors. So I'm just gonna show you, this is a picture of a macular telangiation. You have a various level of vascular changes. And in the, uh, and in the uh, what do you say, a vascular zone, you don't see, uh, in any image over there, corresponding to another image where this is in, uh, in the deep venous plexus itself, you see a lot of vascular uh, uh, images and you see the CM in the uh, vascular zone. Why I showed this you this was that we have basically uh, two visualization patterns for octa that is a cross-sectional and an emphasis. And why is this important? Why did I show you those images? You can imagine that we are converting a three-dimensional image of octa or a data flow into a two-dimensional two emphasis and we're interpreting it. So we are presuming a few things. We're presuming that uh, you're accumulating a lot of blood vessel layers based on only the segmentation into one image. You're losing depth information sometimes when the segmentation volume is uh, uh, not properly done. Uh, two things we have to realize that nature may not always put all the retinal layers according to a textbook picture. Your normal vasculature may go among various retinal layers and your segmentation may not be a true representation of what the, uh, the, the uh, nature intended. And the second point is that alterations that happen in pathology because of uh, swelling of the retina cystoids, the RP pushing up can all change your interpretation of vasculature. So there are risks of segmentation. So if you can see uh, this particular image, you can see that uh, the same CNVM in two different segmentations show, uh, one shows a larger uh, involvement than the second. So these are the, uh, what uh, improper segmentation can do. Besides that, it can cause uh, uh, appearance of uh, abnormal anastomosis, a merger of vessels and uh, under perfused tissue because of a pro improper segmentation. So this is just a simple drawing. I said, if you take the segmentation to the center, you get a large CNBM. If you take the segmentation lines to the top of it, you get a smaller CNBM. This would be very important when you're doing a review. Also segmentation artifacts happen when there's gross pathological changes or anatomical changes in which you have no control over these segmentation lines. Okay, this is an example where the vasculature is totally distorted when you in highly myopic eyes, when you take the, uh, the segmentation is uh, quite difficult to do sometimes. These are other examples of segmentation errors when, when there's a PED, uh, the, uh, the segmentation lines go all over the place, probably cutting the PED uh, in some cases and sometimes not giving you proper vascular information. So uh, these are other things where slab thicknesses also affect. You can see uh, uh, basically non-interpretable uh, choroidal vascular image. You can't uh, find out whether there's a CNBM in the midst of that. 
uh, a few small clues is that obviously you can do manual segmentation, which is a very tedious job, but sometimes you can even choose for smaller scans in which they concur to the, uh, the contour of the RP or the contour of the pathology better. The last is a projection artifact in which uh, it's a very interesting thing is that you, it's also called a decorrelation tail where you get a projection of a superficial uh, layer or sometimes a deeper layer into superficial or vice versa also. Uh, and it causes a false vascular image. And this is why it happens. Basically, it's like any projector system where you have a lamp which causes and it causes a shadow on a screen, which is a projection screen. What, what happens here? When light passes through the retina, it gets modified by retinal structures. Some light is reflected back and taken back by the interferometer and interpreted some light passes through. The light that passes through carries the legacy of the, uh, what do you say, the, the structure above it. And it projects onto the screen. The screen can be the RP, it can be choroid in a very thin retina. And what, what happens when that happens is that you get the vasculature of a, a, a tissue lying above, of a vasculature of a vessel lying above in a deeper layer where you do not expect it to be there. And this becomes critical when you're looking at very fine vascular pathology like CNVMs and all those things. So as I said, there are lamps, the chorea capillary is a lamp and uh, you have uh, screens that the plexiform layers, the, the RP and the sclera screens in which generally you can have uh, uh, projection artifacts to a deep layer. Here you can see uh, in the center of the FAZ, you have a vascular loop, which is, and you can see it over here. And that is an example of a, a projection artifact. There are ways to get around projection. That is, you look at the octa image and you subtract it. There's a probabilistic approach for each layer. You see whether the probability of the, uh, the next uh, layer having that particular, uh, what do you say, vascular structure is there or not. And then the machine does an, uh, uh, an approach to remove it. That's called uh, PAR or projection artifact uh, removal or projection resolve octa. So you can see here, uh, you can see a lot of blood vessels here in the next picture, all of those blood vessels are removed and that's what a PAR on and off does. So essentially the most important thing about PAR is that you have a co-registration. That is multiple scanning protocols have to be included. You need an NFAS, a cross-sectional CT, a cross-sectional octa, and an NFAS octa. And when you have a co-registration- One minute remaining, sir. Okay, I'm nearly done. The other thing is that uh, as uh, a person interpreting an image, you have to sequentially check each layer and, and uh, also look at the structure flow correlation, that is your cross-sectional octa, and uh, also uh, related to the structural OCT to make sure what vascular structure is, uh, is there. Is it there structurally? Do you get a cross-sectional flow? Uh, this is an example where you see some uh, blood vessels in the periphery, but it's a, essentially it's a cyst which has put the blood vessels and you know there is no vascular structure there. You can correlate it with the structure flow. You don't get the vertical uh, elevation of the vascular events. This is my last slide. I'd like to say that the one of the things that people say is good about Okta is that you can do it as many times and review the lesions as far as possible. Here is where the artifacts and the image interpretation is important. When you do a review scan, you have to check these things. You have to check the plane of the scan and the horizontality of scanning. If it is not a horizontal scan the second time, you are going to get different uh, uh, information of the data. You have to check whether the contour is uh, changed and whether the contour is comparable between two scans. Obviously, you have to check the segmentation. You have to check the slab size. If you cannot compare a thin slab on one with a thick slab on another, you'll incorporate more vascular data on the thick slab. You have to check for image quality to rule out, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, attenuation artifacts. And uh, you should not say that there is no flow where, uh, where it was actually an artifact. And you should always check between the layers to know whether there's been a projection of a vascular uh, event on a deeper layer. Thank you for that. And I'd like to say that uh, uh, just informing you of the uh, Retina Imaging Congress, which we're going to have on the 22nd of July this year, and I'm inviting you all for that. Thank you so much for the patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Uni. It's, a, I think, a very complex, uh, challenging talk, and hats off to you. Thank you so much. I yes, want to know. ask him whether he has done any engineering degree because <laughs> I, I suspect he's doing some uh, engineering degree in the evening evening time. <laughs> the innovative, innovative man. <laughs> so, uh, one question is when MPSR was telling in the elevated lesion, you need to do a segmentation. Any specific tips you have, especially when you have a, a large elevated lesion, how to go about with the segmentation in those cases? 
manual segmentation first, first recruit your uh, recruit your most diligent resident make him sit in front of the machine ask him to change 50 scans according to the contour of the uh, retina come back in the evening and apply the segmentation to it that is the only it is a meticulous job it is if you are saying about 60 70 patients in opd you are not going to have time for it you need somebody to sit and change 50 scans and when that is done you can reap the benefits looking at it that's all practice makes man perfect yeah or have uh, residents and fellows here <laughs> yeah uh, what to what unni has said it's so important uh, so meticulous if you have a subtle va- lesion which you are suspecting it's so so important to have all the three slabs at your view both all the on fast st- uh, structural b scan and uh, the vascular flow all these three has to be correlated by the doctor if you have a subtle lesion like what uh, dr srinivas was asking so that gives the 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 depth and the contour and the vascularity so unless you correlate because of this segmentation issues and all these things what unni has beautifully shown uh, there is a there is a high chance that we can go wrong so uh, all these three slab has to be take, seen at the same time anyway i believe there is a there is going to be a consensus uh, eventually on the octa how to Uh, present an octa report like we have hfa is very standard things there there is going to be a very standard way of interpreting or putting up octa so without it we are not we won't be able to compare yes, in the, in, in the new publications that we are uh, submitting all the three that's what i was trying to say all the three sections have to be submitted just one vascular slab and trying to say this vascular so that vascular slab the on fast slab and the structural b scan all the three has to be submitted both for horizontal and vertical so that only gives a you know realistic and logistic uh, you know view of uh, for the viewer or to understand the depth of the lesion thank you very much i hope in the process you all don't start over diagnose this condition i just wondered <laughs> so uh, srinivas should i conclude now yeah yes yeah. madam yeah, so yeah. first and uh, foremost i think it goes without saying that it's been a truly amazing webinar and uh, hats off to srinivas for uh, evolving the idea of doing this and uh, and an amazing set of speakers and just superb expert panel where the discussions were so ultimate and just exactly what everybody should who has not watched it should go back and watch and learn a lot of it and we have been uh, we have created our arc website or rather in the process of completing it where all of these great uh, sessions are going to be compiled and can be used for uh, future reference thank you one and all thanks a lot srinivas as a my co moderator and uh, it's been an amazing learning experience for me and thanks to my arc uh, members as always a special thanks are due to tripal um, and the aios team for always being there very supportive thanks to dr anand uh, sethi and his uh, team you can see how meticulously these webinars are being conducted and how even at till 8:45 sharik is so sincerely committed about telling the time uh, delay and uh, thanks a lot to sai and manjula from numerotech for all those mails which keep bombarding your uh, mailbox and uh, finally and most importantly thanks are due to entor for being absolutely staunch supporters for our arc programs and i think my gratitude with them cannot be expressed in mere words and i think if we are what we are it's because of all our attendees who watch these programs and i think we owe our thanks to them uh, for uh, arc to evolve to whatever stage it has come up to thank you one and all of you